When we think of heaven, we naturally look to the sky. We take our gaze upward to something bigger, something beyond us. Essentially, every culture, religion, and people group have a version of this place in their art and in their stories. Are all of those places the same? How do we know what is fact and what is fable? But what is heaven really like? Who's going to be there? And where exactly is there? Will we know each other? Will we see our loved ones who have gone before us? And if heaven is real, how do we get there? I'll never forget many years ago now when our oldest son was little. He came into our living room. I was watching a game. I don't remember which one. And in his little voice, four or five years old, something like that, he said, Daddy, who's winning? And of course, at that age, he's only interested in team colors, right? He doesn't know names or cities or anything. So I said, you know, the blue team or the red team or whoever. And then I'll never forget, he, he turned and he looked at me with all of the confidence a four or five-year-old could muster. And he says, well, Daddy, that's the team I'm rooting for. <laughs> and I thought, I respect that, don't you? I like to root for a winner. In fact, as a lifelong Cincinnati Bengals fan, believe me, I would love to root for a winner. <laughs> it's probably never going to happen. But we all love to root for a winner. Isn't it true? We all have this friend, okay? We all have this friend. I don't know who it is in your life. I know who it is in mine. But we all have this friend who's a Yankees fan and a Cowboys fan and a Lakers fan. But he or she's from Tampa. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, wait a minute. How, how, how did you grow up a Cowboys fan and a Yankees fan and a Lakers fan? And, you know, and, and it's because you have no conviction or morals, okay? That's, that's why, okay? If that's you today, all right, I have no respect for you, okay? No, I'm just kidding. Well, I don't respect you. I like you, but I just don't respect you. No, we all have that friend, right? Everybody likes to cheer for a winner. In fact, okay, like I have my teams based on where I grew up and all that, and I know many of you do too, but, but I still, I still... <laughs> I'm only most interested when we're winning, right? So I'll give you an example. Just, just this past week, uh, I have some dear friends and, and uh, we, we, we watched the Reds games together just because, you know, James said that the Lord grows your faith through trials. And so, so I watch my Cincinnati Reds every now and then. And the other night, uh, the Reds got a big lead and then we gave it up. It was like nine to nothing at one point. And then we was coming down like to the top of the ninth and we're gonna man, we're gonna, we're gonna blow this lead. I'm, I didn't even watch it. I'm like, I'm not even gonna watch this. I know what happens. I know the end of the movie here. We're gonna lose. And so I, I turned the game. I wasn't gonna watch the game, right? And I got a text from my friend and he said, man, can you believe that? Inside the park home run from like our best player. And so what did I do? I went back and turned the game back on <laughs> because we won the game. And we wanted in part because it's inside the park home run. It sealed the deal. And, and, and I just have to tell on myself here, like if we had lost the game and he had hit an inside the park home run, I probably wouldn't have gone back and rewatched it. But I'll go back and watch the game if I know we're gonna win. And I'm not gonna ask if you're as um, shallow as I am because you would lie and say, oh no, I'm not like that at all. So I'm not gonna put you in that difficult situation. But let me tell you how I work. Like, like, even if the team's down, right, in, in the fourth quarter, if your team is down in the top of the ninth, but you know how the game ends up, somehow, like, I'll go and watch the game. But if I know we lose, there's no point, right? We all, we all like a winner. And, and we're in a series on heaven right now, and, 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 and today we're gonna talk about something super, super exciting because it is the hope of the church. Here, here's what the New Testament teaches us about our future, okay? Even though right now it seems at times, like we're in the fourth quarter, we're in the top of the ninth, and we're down 14 points or four runs, we're going to win the game. We're going we're gonna to win the game, right? 
And, and today what I want to talk about is, is the, the truth and the reality that grounds our hope even in the worst of times. Because here's what we're going to see today, okay? If you're taking notes, just write this down. Our hope is tied to the second coming of Jesus. Our hope is tied to the second coming of Jesus. So that everything that happens in life today, in a very real sense, listen, it has to be filtered through that hope and that truth. In the same way that you're watching your favorite team and it's the top of the ninth and you're losing or it's the fourth quarter and you're losing and it just seems to you like you're not gonna win the game and you get a text because maybe you're watching it you know, an hour behind or you DVR'd it or something and you get this text like, hey, we're gonna win and, and, and you're watching it and it looks like, man, no, there's no way we're gonna pull this off but yet you have this text message that says, like, we're gonna win and you've gotta decide in that moment, was your friend pranking you or were they just ahead in terms of the telecast? And what the New Testament has preserved for us is the teaching of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the teaching of the apostles, that we are going to win the game. That Jesus is going to return. That hope is never lost, no matter how bad things get. And so today, I want you to understand why you and I have hope today. It's because of the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is coming again. Amen. And this is a foundational truth. Let me say it to you this way, okay? There, there, <laughs> there's no incarnation without a coronation. And the incarnation of Jesus is, is, is him coming as God made flesh, okay? That's what we talk about at Christmas time. And let me tell you something. Jesus did not come wrapped in human flesh to live and die and to be raised from the dead so that we die with that hope and that's it. No, he's coming again. And because he died and because he was raised, we will be raised and get the same resurrection as Jesus. See, there's no incarnation without a coronation. The coronation is coming. Another way to think of this is that the earthly ministry of Jesus was Jesus ma manifesting himself as a lamb, but he is coming back as a lion. And, 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 and the hope of the church is tethered to the second coming of Jesus. That's why, listen to me, the second coming of Jesus is a part of the gospel that we hold dear. It's not an addendum. It's not something that's in a footnote or an appendix. It's the last chapter. It's an essential part of the gospel we proclaim. Because if Jesus just came, lived, died, rose from the dead, to never come back and gather to himself all of his children, then everything else was just in vain. But he's coming again. He is going to bring judgment that we talked about last week and eternal life for his children. And not just the New Testament, but even the Old Testament has always looked forward to this day. The Old Testament, you might find this interesting, has about 100 references to the first coming of Messiah. It has about 200 references to the second coming. When you read in the Old Testament, what you wanna look out for is a phrase, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament references the second coming of Jesus. The day of the Lord can refer to the specific day of his coming or it can refer to the season of his coming in the same way that you, we use the word Christmas. Right, Christmas can refer to the day or it can refer to the season. And in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord refers to both the day and the season. But all throughout even the Old Testament era, it was prophesied that the Messiah is coming once, but then he's also coming a final time to establish the eternal state. Of course, the New Testament makes that clear in terms of the person of Jesus and gives us the hope that we have. And so today, I wanna walk through with you many scriptures related to the second coming of Jesus, what it is, what it's going to look like, and I'm going to give you the day and the hour that it's gonna happen, okay? <laughs> it's gonna be in my new book coming out next week. You can buy it in the lobby. The title of my book, it was not during the solar eclipse. That's the title of my book. And if it was, if he did come back during the eclipse, all of us missed it and y'all clearly aren't saved, okay? Because, and I'm not either, because here we are a week later. So uh, I wanna talk about this. And let me, hey, let me just say, before we jump in here, second, second coming, okay? 
Over the next couple of weeks, I actually wanna encourage you to send me your questions about heaven, about the second coming, about hell, about what we're talking about. Um, we've got the next two weeks, we're gonna talk specifically about heaven and what it's gonna look like. And I'm super excited about that. And then the last week of the series, um, I'm gonna take most of the time and answer the questions that you have. And so this is uh, Pastor Jason, our lead worship pastor's personal cell phone. And uh, so feel free to send suggestions, song uh, suggestions, thoughts about all of his jean jackets. Um, no. Uh, this is just a random text number, but for, for real, write this down. Uh, you'll find this on all of our uh, pr promotional stuff today uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. But I'd love to have your questions. You can text them this number, and I'm gonna break those down here in a couple of weeks at the end of this series. But today, I want us to talk about what we call uh, our glorious hope, all right? Our hope, it's the second coming of Jesus, okay? Our hope is tied to the second coming of Jesus. So what's this gonna look like? All right, number one, write this down, okay? I'll show you some scriptures here. The second coming is the visible and global return of Jesus. All right, I want you to understand, when, when we talk about the second coming, we talk about the hope of the church, it's the visible, global return of Jesus. In other words, everybody's gonna know that he's back. The visible, global return of Jesus. Okay, let me take you to 1 Thessalonians 4. Check this out. This is what Paul says. Paul's answering the question, by the way. These are first-generation Christians who had the concern that if they died before the second coming of Jesus, then their souls were lost. And Paul's like, oh, no, 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 not at all. Here's what he said. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. In other words, Paul's saying, this is something I personally discussed with Jesus. This, this is an apostolic word coming directly from Jesus, okay? Here's what Jesus taught them. We who are still alive, when the Lord returns, we'll not meet him ahead of those who have already died. For the Lord himself, watch this, will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. Everybody's gonna see him and everybody's gonna hear the shout. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves and then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and then we will be with the Lord forever. And so encourage one another with these words. Paul says, oh no, you have nothing to fear with respect to those who have died before the second coming. Their souls are not lost. No, they will receive their glorified bodies in the same way that we will at the return of Christ. It's a visible, global return. There will be a shout. There will be a trumpet call. The world will know, the world will see that Christ has returned. And the believers from every single era of the past for us, 2,000 years, will be called up to be with the Lord when he returns, all right? So the second coming, if you're new to church and you're new to heaven, all right, what we mean with the second coming, it's the visible, global return of Jesus. Okay, second, write this down. The second coming is the next big event on God's calendar. It's the next big event. Now, let me just explain to you how cool this is, okay? In the thousands of years that mankind has lived on the earth, we get to live during the day and time when the second coming is the next big event on the calendar. We don't live in a day or a time where like the children of Israel under Moses' leadership, we're just waiting for a land that we can call our own and be delivered from slavery. We're not like those under the Davidic kingdom that are waiting for you know, continued peace that David provides after Saul's reign. And, and, and we're not like the, 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 the Israelites who were, uh, in captivity during the years of the dispersion. And we're not living in the, 
years, 400 years of silence when God was not speaking to his people and were waiting for the return of Messiah. Listen, we are living in the most exciting era of human history. Literally, Jesus has come and fulfilled all the prophecies tied to him. He's lived, he's died, he's been raised from the dead and all we're waiting for now is for him to come back. We live in the most exciting era of human history. That's why throughout the New Testament, we have this period of time in which we live referenced as the last days. You're like, well, 2,000 years is a, a lot of days. Well, it is if you're finite and human like us. It's not if you're infinite like God. 2,000 years for God is nothing. And you and I live in the last days. Here's what that means. The next big event on the calendar is the second coming of Jesus. That's what we're waiting for. There's nothing else standing in the way of his return. And it will be the visible, global, bodily return of Jesus, and it will come soon. It, it will come in these last days, and when it comes, it is, Jesus is, in his return, the hope of the church. Let me tell you what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15. Check this out. He said, so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Notice the parallelism here between Adam and Jesus, okay? We have the first Adam back in Genesis. We have Jesus, the second Adam. Where the first Adam failed, Jesus has triumphed. Death came into the world through the first Adam, and now salvation, life, and resurrection comes through the second Adam. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And after that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. Notice the second coming of Jesus is what we're waiting for. When he comes back, then the end. This is the next big event on God's calendar. Now, I know some of you are wondering, okay, pastor, what about the rapture? It's gonna be in my new book. You're gonna love it. <laughs> Available next week. No. Um, some may be wondering about the millennial reign. I'm gonna talk about that here in a moment. Okay, so here's what I want you to understand, okay? When we come to the New Testament, the hope of the church is the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus is the visible global return of Jesus. It's the next big event on God's calendar. Now, here's the thing. There are various views as to will there be uh, what we might call a secret coming for the church first. Maybe, that's a legitimate view. Others have more of a historic view where that's not the case, okay? There's a lot of different views of different aspects of things in between. Now listen to me. We're not gonna get into the weeds on all that because our hope is not tied to the weeds. And the weeds are secondary. And here at Bell Shoals, you may be in a life group, you may, may know people who have different views on these things, and I want you to hear me say, that is totally okay. Because let me just tell you the truth, okay? I'm always gonna tell you the truth. Here's the truth. Ain't none of you really know? Some of you are like, well, I've been studying the Bible 50 years. Now. No, I know. There's gonna be, you don't know. I'm not buying your book on that. You're not buying my book. We don't know. Do you know why I know we don't know? Because if God wanted us to know, he just would have told us. So I have my own views and I think they're right and you're wrong. <laughs> and you can apologize to me one day in heaven, in eternal state, okay? And you think I'm wrong. Okay, but that's fine. I just want you to understand. You may be in a group with different views on some of those particulars and so forth. If you don't even know what I'm talking about, no problem. Okay, I'm just, my point is those are all secondary things. There's room for disagreement over secondary things. Let me tell you where there's no room for disagreement. The second coming. There is no room for disagreement on that. If we don't believe that Jesus is coming in a visible global sense, that he's coming as the next big event on God's calendar and radar, that he's coming to gather the church and to judge the wicked, then listen, then we are in big trouble. So whatever the particulars of what happens between now and then, what I'm presenting to you today is the foundational truth and the primary hope of the New Testament, which is the second coming, okay? And we make room for variation on other things. That's no problem. 
What we can never, ever, ever disagree on is the fact that Jesus is coming visibly, globally, as the next big event on the calendar. And you say, when is it gonna happen? I actually am gonna tell you when it's gonna happen. Okay, I don't have a day and an hour. Okay, but I do have a season. Here's what the scripture teaches, okay? Because this was, if you've never studied the life of Jesus, this was a big topic of conversation between Jesus and the disciples. Jesus talked a lot about his coming, his second coming. And here's what Jesus taught us, okay? He is going to come after the gospel is preached to the nations. Which is one of the reasons we do what we do here at Bell Shoals. And we're asking you to sign up and go on a mission trip. It'll change your life and it'll spread the gospel. Matthew 24, 14, look at what Jesus says here. The good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. And let me tell you something. We're getting closer every single week to the gospel being preached to every nation. And so the second coming of Jesus is the hope of the church. It's the visible global return of Jesus. It's the next big event on God's calendar. And we're getting close. Because once the gospel is preached to every nation, Jesus will be set to return, all right? So third, write this down. Let me tell you what it will precede, what's gonna come after it, okay? The second coming, this is what we're gonna talk about next week and the week after. It precedes what we know as the millennial reign and the final judgment. The second coming precedes the millennial reign, thousand year reign of Jesus and the final judgment. This is what's cool described for us in detail is that when Jesus returns, he will gather his people to himself, will have our resurrection, will receive our glorified bodies. We'll talk more about that in the next couple of weeks. And, and then we will actually reign and rule with Jesus on earth for a thousand years, a period where Satan is bound and the the kingdom of Christ is established. At the end of the thousand year reign, Satan will be loosed and there'll be a final battle. And then after that, there'll be a final victory, final judgment, eternal state. Okay, let me show you some scriptures here about this, okay? So we're thinking about second coming. It's the hope of the church, visible global return of Jesus, next big event on God's calendar, and it will precede the thousand year reign of Jesus and then the final judgment. Can we take you to Revelation 20? All right, Revelation 20, by the way, is the primary reason I hold to a literal thousand year reign of Jesus. If it weren't for Revelation 20, there would be other legitimate views. Revelation 20 seems to indicate that there is a millennial reign coming after the return of Jesus. Here's what John said. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit and then he shut and locked, locked it so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Okay, let me go to verse seven. When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out and deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for a battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it and the earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. This is what we call the great white throne judgment. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead and death and, and the grave gave up their dead and all were judged according to their deeds. And then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death and anyone who whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire. We talked about that last week. So here's what the scripture teaches us, okay? The second coming of Jesus, next big event on God's calendar, visible global return of Jesus. He will gather the righteous to himself. There'll be a thousand years of peace. At the end of that thousand years, Satan will be loosed. There'll be a final battle. And then there is what we call the great white throne judgment where every single person Philippians 2 teaches us this, we'll bow the knee and we'll acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then there will be 
a separation between those who continue to rebel. They, they acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, but they do not submit their hearts to him and those who have been saved by his grace. And this will inaugurate the eternal state we'll talk about next week. Now, this is both a sobering reality and a reality that grounds our hope. That there is a day of judgment. There's a day of reigning and ruling with Jesus. His second coming precedes this millennial reign and then the final judgment. And Jesus taught us about this in two key places, Matthew 13 and Matthew 24. And here's what Jesus taught us. I just want you to see, this is so encouraging, you guys. So encouraging. He has several, several analogies that he uses. Let me just give you one, one of my favorites, okay, in Matthew 13. Here's what he said, okay. Here's a story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. And when the crop began to grow and produce and produce grain, the weeds also grew. So you've got the crop and you've got the weeds. And so the farmer's workers went to him and said, sir, the field where you planted that good seed, it's full of weeds. Where in the world did they come from? Well, we know where they come from, the enemy. And here's what he said, the enemy has done this. This is Satan, right? Jesus has given us an analogy. The farmer said, so should we pull out the weeds they asked? Do you want us to go through the field and let us just yank out these weeds? He said, no. Because there's no way for you to grab all the weeds without also damaging the wheat. And so he said, let them both grow up together until the harvest, and then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, burn them, and put the wheat in the barn. Jesus told another parable very similar. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a fisherman who draws in the net, and within the net, there's some really good fish and there's some really bad fish. And do you try to, do you try to like cut out the bat? No, 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 no. You just take the net, you open it up on the ground. When you get to shore, you separate the good from the bad. Jesus says, here's what's coming. There is coming a day after his visible global return and after his millennial reign, when at the great white throne judgment, he will separate the weeds and the wheat. And the only hope for us in terms of being in that eternal state with Christ and having eternal life is that right now we acknowledge the lordship of Jesus. We receive his forgiveness based on his suffering on our behalf. And we ask him to save us. That is how we pass from death to life. Now here's what's so cool about this. Right now, some of you are living with a lot of weeds in your life. Let me tell you something, cancer is a weed planted here by the evil one. Broken relationships, betrayal, abuse. Let me tell you something, we live in a world with a lot of injustice. We live in a world with a lot of weeds. And if you're like me, you can become so frustrated and even angry at times with a righteous kind of anger about all of the weeds. You say, Lord, are you not gonna deal with these weeds? Can't we go through and pull up these weeds? Can I deal with this person or can I deal with this issue? God, God what, 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 why are you allowing all this to happen? And hear the word of Jesus. I love you. I got you. I'm with you. The day of the harvest is coming. And I can't pull up all the weeds right now without hurting the wheat. But a day of harvest is coming and I'm gonna make right all those wrongs. And I promise you, if you know me and love me, there's coming a day that sickle is gonna fall and the net's gonna open and I'm separating the good from the bad and you will be with me in paradise. That is our hope, right? That is our hope. So I know for some of you right now, you feel like you're in the top of the ninth and you're losing by four runs and there's no way you're gonna win the game. Trust me, the home run hitter is coming to the plate. The sickle is gonna fall. The net is gonna be open. And the weed and the wheat are gonna be separated for all eternity. 
and the righteous will receive their reward. You see, this is the hope of the second coming. This is why we fix our eyes forward on it. This is why we live according to it because there is coming a day when Jesus is gonna make everything right, everything new. This is the hope of the church. So the second coming is visible, it's global. It's, it's, um, it's a coming that's the next big event on God's calendar, okay? It's gonna precede this millennial reign and then the final judgment, okay? And then, listen forth, make a note of this. Here's what I want you to understand. It's gonna take the world by surprise. You know, what, you know what amazes me? There seem to be a lot of people running around this earth that seem to love weeds. They like dysfunction. They like chaos. They like to do things that inflict pain and injustice on other people. Boy, there's a lot of people running around here who seem to love the weeds. And this isn't in the Bible, it's just my weird mind. But Jesus coming with a weed whacker. You know what I'm saying? Don't write that down with a chapter and a verse, okay? But I like to think of this Jesus. Oh, he's coming. He's coming. And I want you to understand the difference between the weeds and the wheat. The weeds have no idea. They think that their injustice will go unpunished. They think they're getting away with their rebellion. They think this life is all there is, or they foolishly think, yeah, everybody goes to a better place. No, 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 and the New Testament teaches, makes us clear that our world is about to be radically caught off guard. So here's how this ought to encourage you. Do not for one moment be discouraged by their arrogance and confidence. They don't know what's coming. 1 Thessalonians 5, here's what Paul says. Now concerning how and when all of this will happen to your brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. <laughs> Actually, you do, Paul. That'd be super helpful, but okay. <laughs> but here's our focus. He says, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night when people are saying, everything is peaceful and secure just the way we like it. Disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. I want you to see what Jesus taught, Matthew 24. We often overlook, this is what we call the Olivet Discourse where Jesus gave these words. This is Jesus' most profound teaching on his second coming. And much of the focus is on how the world will be surprised. Check this out. Then at last, a sign of the Son of Man is coming it will appear in the heavens and there will be deep mourning among the peoples of the earth. The weeds will not rejoice because Jesus is coming with a weed whacker, right? The, no, there's mourning. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, the second coming is the visible global coming of Jesus. He will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet. They will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you know that his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. And when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time when Noah entered the boat and it started raining. And people didn't realize what was gonna happen until the flood came and swept them all away. And that's the way it's gonna be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in a field and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Here's Jesus' point, okay? Jesus in this particular text is not talking about secret rapture of the church. Jesus is talking about the suddenness of his coming. Because in the days of Noah, the righteous were not taken, the wicked were. What Jesus is talking about here is the suddenness of his coming. Do you remember all those people who mocked Noah? Do you remember all those people that thought he was an idiot for building that big boat? Some of you have been up to Kentucky. There's only two men who've ever built an ark, okay? 
Noah and Ken Ham. All right, so there's this ark up in somewhere near Cincinnati. You can go look at it. Okay, it's massive. Okay, I'm just saying, you just do the math on how big this, big this was. You see how long it took. And there's all these people mocking Noah and his sons. Of course they were. Like, dude, what in the world are you doing? Like you're building something we've never seen the use for. And they're mocking him, right? And then Noah goes in, the Lord shuts the door and there he is inside this boat and everybody else is eating and drinking and watching TV and hanging out and just, just having fun and living life. These unbelievers and they have no fear and, and they have all the confidence in the world that Noah's an idiot, just like a lot of people today. Then it started raining. And it kept raining and raining and raining. And I know we like to depict Noah's ark with like, (laughs) some of you have this in your nursery at home and I don't fault you for this, it's all good, okay? When it's your baby, there's a lot of exceptions, okay? You can, you know, but Noah's got his nice white beard and the animals are happy two by two and there's this beautiful rainbow and it's all pastels and right, it's like, Jazz, like, it's all happy times, okay? You know what we miss in all these renderings of Noah's Ark? The people who would have been grasping at the boat who were drowning. Put that on your mural in your baby's room. <laughs> if you want an accurate rendition, all you people that are messing the Bible up, okay? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, you know what I'd like to do one day? Like, I'll just sell it to churches, not to the general public, but like have a little Noah's Ark set like with Lego people, but it includes people who are like grasping at the boat and drowning. Wouldn't that be fun? Okay, no, I'm kidding. All right, I'm kidding. I'm saying seriously, like here's Jesus' point. Like we forget this dynamic of Noah's in the ark, it's raining, it's flooding, and all of a sudden, these people on the earth aren't mocking him anymore. And, um, okay, this is, I mean, I'm just telling you, this is crazy, you guys. For years and years and years, they watched him building that boat. And yet the rainfall surprised them. And Jesus says, that's what my coming is gonna be like. For 2,000 years, millions of Christians all around the world have been telling the world, judgment is coming. Jesus is coming. And the world pays no attention. Many of them mock us. Many of them criticize you. You have family members who give you a hard time because of your Christian faith. I've talked to believers around the world who have been ostracized from their families because of their faith in Jesus. And the warnings are there and the gospel is preached and we're going to the nations, but yet the world still persists in its injustices. Would you hear the word of Jesus? The sickle is going to fall. And when it does, it will catch the unbelieving world by surprise. And it will be too late. And so let me give you the last thing and the hope of the church then. Okay, the second coming should find believers ready. Say, Pastor, I don't know the day or the hour, neither does Jesus. That's not what Jesus said. Well, okay, no, that is what he said, actually. (laughs) That, that, the message to you and me is not, oh, well, we don't know when he's uh, coming, so just kind of let bygones be by. No, 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 no. Jesus actually said, you ought to know we're getting into the end of the game. You ought to have some idea we're coming into the ninth inning, the fourth quarter. Jesus, this is what many people misunderstand in the church. They think, well, okay, his, his coming is gonna surprise the world, but, but Jesus spends as much time saying, but it shouldn't surprise you. You ought to be ready. You shouldn't be caught off guard with how you're living your life. You shouldn't be caught off guard with with, uh, wrong priorities. No, here's what he says, Matthew 24. So you too must keep watch for for don't you know what day your Lord is coming? The, The season, it's close. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, right? He would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready. He says you ought to be ready at the time for the Son of Man will come when you least expect. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, there'll be a reward. 
I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all of the owns. We're gonna talk about that in the next couple of weeks. What the eternal state will involve. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, well, my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected and he'll cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, if you're not anticipating the second coming of Jesus, you're not living for the second coming of Jesus, you've not set your hope on the second coming of Jesus and you demonstrate you don't know Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, but you aren't in the dark, Paul says, church family. You aren't in the dark about these things. You don't know the day or the hour, but you should know the season. You, won't, you should not be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. The world will be surprised. You should not. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. And so encourage one another and build each other up just as you're already doing. Listen, Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. I believe we're coming to the end of the game. And when Jesus comes back, here's the point. You ought to be ready for him. Don't think for a moment, just because we don't know the day or the hour, that we shouldn't be ready. That is not the teaching of the Bible. If you're a follower of Jesus today, you ought to be ready in how you live your life and how you steward what you have and how you spend your time and how you seek to influence those around you. Jesus like, you ought to be ready. Don't be like me as a kid, all right? Where every day after school, my brother and I got home and we knew mom was coming home from work. And that every day we had a list of chores to unload the dishwasher and clean up the living room and do our laundry. But every single day we walked by the Nintendo and we were drawn to its power. And every single day we said, oh, we can just play a few games here. We'll have enough time to get our chores done before mom gets home. And every single day when we heard the garage door open, it was too late. It was too late. And then we were sent up to our room to await the return of our father where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. (laughs) And you would have thought, hey, moron, after the third time, why don't you figure this thing out? Get your chores done and then turn the Nintendo on. And every single time my brother and I were like, yeah, but apparently you never played Super Mario Brothers. We got enough time, we got time, we're gonna know. And then like, we're always, the garage door opens and we just look at each other and try and turn it off. And you know, like our parents weren't gonna know what we were doing. And here's what Jesus says, dear ones, okay? Okay, a couple things here on the second coming. I just want you to understand, visible, global, it's coming. It's the hope of the church. It will be too late for those who have rejected him because there's gonna be a millennial reign and a final judgment, that's it. That, Jesus is coming to gather his church to himself. We'll have our glorified bodies, we'll talk about that next week. But listen to me, when he comes, okay, the world's gonna be completely caught off guard. You and I should not. And today, okay, like we don't know. Like, is it today, tomorrow? We don't know. But, but here's what we know, we're getting close and we gotta live our lives in such a way that we honor King Jesus. And if you're not doing that today, I'm telling you lovingly, you need to submit to the will of your good, kind, heavenly father who loves you and cares for you and wants only the best for you before he sends his son back here and you're caught off guard because he's coming. And Paul says, encourage one another. If you're dealing with some weeds today with your health, your family, your job, your finances, whatever it may be, I want you to understand we're, we're all in this together. We're with you, man the sickle's about to fall. The separation's gonna happen and we'll be with the Lord forever. So would you be encouraged today? Don't let the arrogance and the confidence of the world get the best of you. They have no idea what's about to come, who's about to come. And um, our hope is tied to Jesus. So, so let me ask you to stand with me today and... Um, I'm gonna give you one more word of scripture and then I'm gonna pray for us and we'll go. And next week we'll talk about, next two weeks actually, what heaven is like in terms of this eternal state. And um, let me give you this word as I pray. 
Hebrews 10. So let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Do you believe that today? God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another, right? To love and good works, Bell Shoals. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some do, but let us encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. The second coming gives us hope, gives us purpose, gives us endurance. He's coming. Be encouraged, be motivated. We're in this together. We serve a great savior whose coming is soon. And so let's pray to that end. Father, we thank you for these truths and this hope that we have. This is our blessed hope that one day you will send your son and our savior back to us. And whether that happens in our lifetime or after you've already called our spirit to be with you, Father, we know that that day is coming soon. So I pray that in whatever situation we find ourselves today, we will be encouraged and motivated Father, just as your word tells us in multiple places, God, that we, 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 we would be inspired by this hope that we have, that it would ground our confidence. God, it would shape our lives, our marriages, our families, our careers. God, we serve you, we live for you. And, and one day we will spend eternity with you. And so God, no matter how bad things get today, we know that your son is coming and he will usher in a final victory for all of us who believe. So we pray as John did, that you would come soon, King Jesus, and usher in your millennial reign in the eternal state so that we might be with you forever. We thank you for this hope as we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.